Thank you very much for having me and Google. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, so I suppose to start off to ask, you know, um, tell us a bit about the, the background to you writing um, Dark Skies and what, uh, what went into that. Yeah, so um, it was a bit of an interesting um, idea I, I had. I Basically, my, my then boyfriend, now husband, uh, hence the name change, by the way, um, he is a session musician. So every now and then, he goes off on tour for a few weeks a year. And I kind of have to spend a lot of time at home on my own with the dogs, which is fine. I don't mind that. Um, and I remember one evening in summer, I live in, in the South Downs, which is an international dark sky reserve, so we have amazing night skies. Uh, really, really lucky that you can be able to see the stars really easily. And I remember one evening I was sitting in our old flat and I was, I'd watched every Louis Theroux documentary on Netflix and I was just so fed up of just being inside every evening watching my computer. And I looked outside and it was this beautiful evening, kind of dusk falling. And I thought, do you know what, I love walking. I'm not really ready for bed. I'm just going to go, go and drive to Butser Hill, which is um, near where I live, and I'm going to go for a walk because it's a really lovely evening. So I drove up there, um, and I kind of spent about an hour and a half walking around Butser Hill, um, just watching the stars and, and just listening to the landscape and getting completely lost. Um, and eventually I found my way back and, and went home again. But I, it was a really, really um, kind of magical experience for me, and it kind of got me a little bit hooked into this hidden world after dark that we so often don't really explore unless we're drunk or on a night shift. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And then you spent, what, about a year or so traveling to various places and having these experiences and, and writing about them? Yeah, so it was about a year. I, I kind of went around the UK, um, mainly around the South, but I did go around other places as well, um, just kind of exploring lots of different habitats and places after dark, mainly kind of countryside landscapes, but I also um, reflected on my time in London and wrote about visiting the Greenwich Observatory. Um, and then I also went to um, northern France and I went to Norway and Finland as well, um, mm. just to see the polar night and the midnight sun, just to kind of think about different ways we um, look at the night time that's not necessarily associated with the darkness. And I think, you know, you had some quite unusual experiences you talk about. One of them I liked was floating down the river in a, in a coracle, um, <laughs> a, a one-man boat. On the, is it the Dart, I think you're on? Yeah, the River Dart, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I used to work, um, there's a place called Butzer Ancient Farm in Hampshire, which is lovely if anyone ever wants to go there. Um, and I worked there before I went freelance as creative developer, which is as vague as it sounds. Um, and I absolutely loved it. And one of the things I kind of got really interested in was heritage crafts, because they, they celebrate all things to do with prehistory and ancient life there. And, and they kind of have amazing old buildings and rare breed animals and stuff. And I got really interested in heritage crafts and I kind of learned how to carve a wooden spoon and learned how to do some blacksmithing. It was so fun and I got really addicted to it. And um, one, one day someone I was working with said, oh, I've just booked onto this workshop in the Chilterns. I'm going to learn to make a coracle in one day. Um, she was like, do you want to come? I was like, yes, obviously I do. That sounds amazing. So if anyone doesn't know, a coracle is like a, a kind of round, slightly oval shape. It's quite, quite about that big probably. And it's like a basket. And they date right back to people think the last ice age. So they're really, really like prehistoric form of a boat. And uh, they, they're still used in some kind of um, older traditional places now. But um, they're yeah, like a big basket. And you, you sit on it <laughs> and you float down the river. And it's really easy to capsize, um, which I've discovered. Uh, but yeah, I made one. And it's really nice because the, the authentic way of making them, is you, you have this wooden kind of cage. And then you, you're meant to cover it with either animal skins or pitch tar stuff, which obviously I wasn't going to do because I wanted it to last and I don't know. I'm vegetarian, I don't want to use an animal skin. Um, so we used a PVC lorry lining instead, very authentic. Um, but it was great because I've bashed it into a million rocks and it still hasn't broken. So yeah, it was really, really fun. And that was one of the experiences I love most actually. We decided to go on this dusky sail down the river Dart. We thought it would be really easy and plain sailing and the rapids are tiny, but when you're in a coracle, the rapids are huge. <laughs> and so we capsized a million times, ended up gashing my leg open on a rock, and it was just the best, best evening of my life. It was great. <laughs> and, and although the book is called Dark Skies, I mean, one of the chapters is actually about kind of the opposite of that, where you went to Norway in the summertime, where in the very north, inside the Arctic Circle, the sun never sets. Um, and sort of saw the, the, the midnight sun there, and that must have been, I've not done that, but uh, you know, quite an experience, I imagine. Yeah, so actually it was Finland I went to. Finland, yeah, sorry. Norway in the winter and Finland in the summer, yeah. The, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I went to Helsinki, which mm. I was surprised, because I thought I'd have to go further north than that to see the midnight sun, but actually the whole of Finland in midsummer is 
it doesn't really get dark. It kind of gets dark between 1 a.m. and 2 a.m. But it doesn't really get dark. It kind of just gets like dawn light. And then it's like, the sun's up again, another day. You've had an hour's sleep. Um, but it was great. And yeah, I wanted to kind of go and see the two cultures differently um, and kind of experience what it was like to go and just live where it's just constant sunlight. And it was uh, the most brilliant experience. Everyone was lovely. Everyone was, the whole place was just alive. I feel like this, because they have these three months of darkness, when the summer comes around, it's like they're making up for it. And they're like, right, no one goes to sleep for three months. We're just going to have a great time. Um, and I went hiking in the forests outside Helsinki. And I got really, I got stuck for ages chasing this black woodpecker. So um, I really love birds. <laughs> and um, I'd, there was loads of these amazing woodpeckers in the woods. And there was this black one that I could hear thudding around me. And I, was ch I literally chased it for about three hours because I was like, I've got to see this woodpecker. Um, and eventually I did flush out of a clearing. And it looks like a Nazgul from Lord of the Rings because they don't flap their wings. It just like glided across the clearing. And I was like, oh. <laughs> it was really creepy. But it was great. It was so worth it. But I was actually, I ended up chasing it for so long that I missed my last bus home back to Helsinki. I had to hitchhike home with a guy called Colin. Um, so if Colin, you're watching us, thank you. Colin had to be I know, someone said that. He was very blonde, so right. I don't know. Okay. Um, yeah, but it was great. And yeah, the city was just amazing. Everyone out was out in the middle of the night. But it wasn't like a night out here where everyone's kind of drunk and falling about. It was kind of like the middle of the day when everyone's just kind of having lunch and, and there was music playing. And it was just this really lovely, energetic, amazing atmosphere. And yeah, I absolutely loved it. Yeah, it sounds fantastic. And then, as you say, Norway then in the winter to the Arctic Circle to see, I think, see the northern lights then. And, yeah. Um, I think you thought you might read a little passage from your book about, yeah. about that experience. I can definitely do that. Yeah, yeah. Norway was amazing. So I went to um, the city of Tromsø, which I was told how to pronounce it because I was like, where's Tromsø? Um, and they're like, no, it's Tromsø. Um, so it's this really lovely city in the Arctic Circle. And um, it's got a little university. And it's really small, actually. And it was really cozy. And I went there for a few days, mainly yeah, to see the polar night, um, to, again, experience what it was like to live in three months of darkness and how people cope with that. Um, and obviously, the Northern Lights was something I had my fingers crossed that I was going to see. And as you can tell from the front cover, I did see them. Um, so yeah, I thought I would read a little bit, a little extract. My first night with the Aurora had given me a taste for more. So I booked onto a group visit to the edges of the city to go Aurora hunting by following waves of electromagnetic activity across Troms County in a little minibus. Our group leader and Aurora expert, Emils, was from Latvia. I asked him how he coped in Norway with three months of darkness. And he said he spent a lot of time snowshoeing, a recreational activity involving hiking through the snow using specially made shoes. Emils had brought snowsuits for anyone not wearing enough layers. After half the group had pulled them on, we all piled into the minibus and drove towards the mountains. The app I had on my phone informed me the conditions were right tonight. Via the app, I watched a minute-by-minute -minute update of a map of Northern Europe that showed high electromagnetic activity with what looked like a cloud of nuclear waste moving slowly towards Norway. After 20 minutes or so, we stopped by the side of the road. The eight of us had been chatting for the entire journey. Most of us were jammed into the middle of the vehicle, so peering through the windows was impossible. As the doors rolled open, out I fell, landing underneath the most majestic sky I had ever seen. If I were to compare the aura I'd seen at Presvenet Lake, which was earlier in the book, to a freshwater stream with colours bubbling through the ether, this aurora could only be described as a frenzied, blistering river of lava that was ripping the sky into pieces. With the lights of the city far behind us, the air was ablaze with colour. Blues and greens still shone from the core, but along the edges, the burnt pinks and oranges of grapefruit zest and coral, the violet of aubergines and mallow flowers, the sky was open to us all, and our hotchpotch group of travellers from across the globe joined, joined together for one moment to bathe in electromagnetic beauty. Emils gathered up a pile of logs from the back of the bus and lit a fire on the icy road, and we watched the ice disintegrate beneath the flames. For the next hour, we took it in turns to wander beneath the aurora, capturing long exposure photos, observing the ripples and tides of light as it streamed over our heads like rainbows liberated from their geometric constraints. We drank hot chocolate to warm up, huddled by the fire when the cold penetrated too deeply into our bones and sinews. Beneath my ski jacket in multiple layers, I could feel the scratchy heat of my merino jumper against my bare skin as I enjoyed the hot trickle of chocolate working its way to my stomach. A French couple in our group had started dancing to electro swing playing from their phone to keep back the cold. I hopped around the fire with an Australian girl who explained that the stars look different on this side of the world.
Thank you. I think um, one of the things that comes across reading your book is that for most of us who live you know, in or around London or in the southeast, it's actually, you know, it's really quite hard to see the proper night sky because there's so much light pollution. But, but in a strange way, that's actually quite a modern thing, relatively speaking, that, you know, even going back maybe 200 years, people would have been much more accustomed to, to seeing the stars, to seeing the night sky. Um, and, you know, I wonder, you know, what, what do you think are the, you know, the, the positives of getting out out away from light pollution and seeing the, the true night sky for, for those of us who do live you know, in urban light polluted areas. Yeah, it's really interesting because light pollution is it's an environmental problem but it's never really very highly prioritised because let's be honest we've got a million other environmental problems to think about um, and it is, it is an important one and I think for the human connection with nature it's particularly important because when I go out and look at the stars without getting too hippy dippy. Um, I love looking at the stars and firstly, it's kind of two things. It's, it's kind of giving me a sense of place in the history of our time. So you're looking at the same stars that are so old and ancient that our ancestors 2000 years ago were looking at the same stars and they haven't changed and that's that connection that we have with the past. And similarly, 2000 years from now, hopefully, <laughs> there'll be other humans who have descended from us looking at the same stars. And that's a really, really amazing connection. Um, and similarly, you know, it's the same connection as people all around the world looking at the stars. We're all looking at the same thing, uh, not necessarily at the same time. But I think also, looking at the universe and looking at the stars, we're, we're quite a, um, us, uh, our species is a little bit arrogant, let's be honest. We kind of think the world revolves around us. And it doesn't. And I think looking at the universe and the stars, gives us such a sense of insignificance in a really good way because it's really great to humble ourselves and remind ourselves that we're part of this magnificent ecosystem that's so fragile and so vast and so intricate and subtle and we are just one tiny part of that and I think that's a really really important thing to remember and it's also I find really reassuring because if my life is insignificant so are all my little problems you know they're not really that big a deal in the in the vast scale of the universe. <laughs> yeah, I think that's right isn't it? And I mean, from a practical point of view, where, where should people go? Like, where, where, where would you go to, to see, to experience dark skies, you know, in, in the south? I mean, I'm very lucky because, yeah, the South Downs where, where I live has recently, just a few years ago, been designated an international dark sky reserve. So um, we have really amazing conditions for, for stargazing, especially Butser Hill. I think that's the darkest place in the South Downs that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, so the whole of the South Downs National Park is amazing for stargazing. Uh, they did all this amazing stuff. I went to a presentation about it and they, they had to do all this crazy stuff like change all the light bulbs in the streets and s turn all the street lamps downwards so that it weren't reflecting up. They did so much work and it's really amazing actually because it's really paid off. Mm. Um, but yeah, and the South Downs is so close to London. I mean, it literally takes me an hour to get from Petersfield where I live to, um, to London Waterloo. So it's so easy just to get out and spend a weekend out, out there. Um, but we have quite a few dark sky reserves around the country. So there's um, Exmoor's one, um, Brecon Beacon, where else? There's a, quite a few up north, um, Northumberland, there's a lot of, and obviously Scotland. Um, but yeah, particularly in the south, I would really recommend coming down to the South Downs because it's a nice place to visit anyway. <laughs> and um, if you spend the weekend, you can get out and, um, yeah, and hopefully have clear skies and, and see the really amazing stars that we do have. I think one of the nice anecdotes that struck me in your book was about um, in Los Angeles in, after the earthquake in 1994. So they had an earthquake and the, obviously the power was cut. And so at night there was, there was no lights and people were phoning the police <laughs> saying there was a weird cloud in the sky. And it was, um, it was the Milky Way. They'd never seen the Milky Way. <laughs> They'd never, never, seen, never seen, it. seen it. They didn't know what it was. I uh, thought that was, that was a, yeah. Yeah, that is mad, Imagine isn't it? Imagine happened in London probably. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> And um, sort of change attack a bit. We just actually last week was Halloween, and um, in your book you talk a lot about, or bitterly, like that's about the the earlier Gaelic festival. Is it um, Samhain? Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, yeah, it's, that's um, that's how you pronounce it. Yeah. And I think there's definitely a sense, isn't there, that the the night, and particularly like the the darker, longer nights, are when we're more kind of readily frightened, and we we, we kind of you know get more sort of that the Halloween vibe kind of comes on. So I wonder, you know, had any thoughts about where that comes from, and you know. So any, any, I mean, any spooky experiences during your <laughs> research? Yeah, I mean, it's really, it's really interesting, actually, our fear of the dark. It's actually called nyctophobia, I found out. That's the, what it means to be um, the fear of the dark. And I think, actually, having kind of read around it and 
tried to understand it, it's actually fear of what the dark conceals. It's not really the dark itself. It's, it's because we can't see what, what's in the dark. Um, and I think that is something that's very inherently, not just human, but for any kind of diurnal species that spends its, its life out in the day and then hides away at night. The night is a, a time to be predated and to be scared. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting, this Halloween Samhain time. Um, I, I, I definitely... I. I People are like, oh, do you believe in ghosts and that sort of thing? I don't think I do, but I have definitely had uh, a really couple of spooky times writing this book. I went to, so I live on the Hampshire-Sussex border, and just over in Sussex, there's a place called Kingley Vale, which is said to be, well, it's a big yew forest. It's beautiful. It's like a, a nature reserve, but it's said to be haunted by Viking ghosts. Um, and I decided to go on a nocturnal walk <laughs> through this through this Kingly Vale, and it was it was quite frightening. And I I really like to think of myself as a rational person. I really do. Um, and I was like, don't worry, it's just a fox. It's just an owl. Calm down. But um, walking through this forest in the middle of the night with no moonlight and these yew trees just creeping over you. I definitely got really spooked. I didn't see a Viking ghost, but you know, he might have just been lurking out of my vision. <laughs> and I think as well at night, like your senses, the senses that you do have left, so not your vision, but your, your hearing and like the sense of smell are all seem to be heightened, don't they? So yeah. stuff is, yeah. And it's great. That's one of the loveliest things about it because we're so, we so rely on our eyesight because we have great eyesight as humans, most of us do. Um, and so we're very, we're not very tuned into the rest of our senses and they're so powerful. They're just, they're almost it's just as good as our eyes really and it is amazing once your eyesight disappears and you know especially if there's no mo if, the, if it's clouded over and the moonlight's not shining you literally can't see a thing um, and it's great because you have to rely on on kind of all your hearing and a sense of smell and, and it's amazing this kind of I can't really describe it but when you're walking along in the dark with trees either side of you there's something very subconscious going on almost like kind of echolocation where you can sense where the trees are you can't see them and I'm not touching them but somehow just m what I'm radiating off and then what's reflecting back you can sense where everything is and it's this really powerful way of navigating through the dark without your eyesight and it, it is actually a lot easier than you think it is but you definitely have to just accept you can't see and just tune into something a little bit deeper or more primitive mm. but it's, it's good fun yeah. <laughs> and maybe it's exactly that right that you know because light hasn't you know, artificial light hasn't been around for that long you know, if you go back a few hundred years, you would have had to, you know, re relied on that, on those sort of senses. They're still there, but just we don't need them now, so we don't use them. So the yeah. muscle is wasted away. From yeah, us. definitely. And I think you know, it's it's easy to romanticise the past and be like, oh, they had this amazing connection with the night, which they did. But obviously, they also had. I mean, if you go far enough back, they had wolves and bears and things. <laughs> so there were actually real things to fear in the mm. night. Whereas today, actually, sadly, if you think about it, the thing we really fear is other humans. That's really the only, th apart from falling down a hole. Um, that's the only thing that we're really genuinely f afraid of in the dark. Um, but yeah, I do think, uh, you know, just going back just a few hundred years, you're right, they didn't have coffee, they didn't have electricity, go if you go back far enough. Um, and the night, that's what you actually find when you, you know, in these Celtic fire festivals that I wrote about, um, like Beltane and Samhain and um, all these amazing Celtic festivals, a lot of them, they take place over a 24 hour period. It's not just something to be celebrated in the day. They all have a nighttime part as well. And it's all about embracing the whole cycle of life and not just hiding away in the dark because they had no choice. It was dark. Mm -hmm. They might have had a fire to kind of sit around, but they couldn't just go to sleep in winter. You can't just go to sleep when it gets dark because you'll be asleep for like over half the day. It'll be ridiculous. They had stuff to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's really interesting. I, I'm very fascinated by that kind of seasonal living and connecting back to kind of living more in, in sync with the rhythms of the day, mm. if we can. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. quite hard. <laughs> what was your most memorable dark sky encounter, either, either writing this book or before or indeed since it? Obviously, seeing the Northern Lights was something that I had basically wanted to see since I was about 10 and I read His Dark Materials by Philip Pullman. I was like, well, what are these Northern Lights? I've got to go see them. It took me 16 years, but I got there. Um, that was a very amazing experience. But um, I also loved, I went down to so my friend Tom, um, Tom Cox, he write, he's another author, and he used to live in Devon and he lived near where they reintroduced beavers into the River Otter. And he was Ironically. like, yeah, I know, I know. Um, didn't see any otters, sadly. Um, and and I, I saw that he'd been to see them and I was like, oh, I'm so jealous. He was like, I'll show you where they are. So um, he took me, I, I went down and visited him and 
he showed me where their little lodge was and there was absolutely no guarantee that we would see these beavers but we waited and waited and and the dusk fell and finally we heard this plop and um, one of the beavers came out of the lodge and swam along and then another one came out and uh, they were kind of we just watched them for ages just busying themselves around kind of dragging vegetation around and that was a really really amazing experience because we hear so many sad stories about wildlife these days and beaver reintroduction has been like an outright success and to go and see them these creatures that were ex made extinct they're native to the UK they were made extinct 400 years ago and but they're now back and the government is actually allowing them to stay it's crazy yeah. um, so that's a really really that was a really lovely thing to go and see where do they get the beavers from where, where do they stay then well the first one in the river otter it was like un unofficially done so someone basically snuck them into the river right. <laughs> I think they they've been trying trying to do these trials for ages to be like, look, beavers are meant to be here, they can help with flooding, and the government just didn't let them. So someone was like, well, I've had enough of this. They just released some beavers. And uh, they were like, well, they're there now. <laughs> but since then, um, the I think the government's been like, OK, they're not, they're, they're OK. Let's, and now there's actual, um, I went to see, as part of my forestry commission residency I've been doing, I went to see beavers in Cropton Forest in Yorkshire, and that's an official trial, so they've all been like, allowed out and they get them either from Scotland because there's lots of beavers in Scotland or from Europe right okay. yeah and so you know, what what's next for you what have you got sort of um, further books in the pipeline or further projects or what's the what's on the agenda yeah yeah, um, I have. I, as a freelance creative, there's always lots of little things going on. I, I have definitely been, so I've been finishing off my writing project. So I've been writer in residence for the Forestry Commission this year, which has been really fun. And I kind of gave all that in about a month ago. So I'm just tying all that off, which is really nice. And then I have got books four and five mulling away in my head. So hopefully they'll, <laughs> I'll start writing them soon. Um, but I'm also, because I'm an illustrator, I, I, I kind of, um, I've just reopened my online shop, so I'm kind of trying to get more into, I do a lot of illustrated poetry and that sort of thing, trying to kind of just, you know, spread that around the world a bit more. And I also have a really cool project for next year, which I want to do um, nature-inspired wallpaper. So, yeah, so I've got quite a lot of things going on. <laughs> but, you know, it's, yeah, so um, a few, I, that's the problem when you're, when you're vaguely creative, you just, your idea is just like, yeah, all your ideas and you have to just write them down and try not to think about them, otherwise you just don't get anything mm. done. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, it's been really nice talking to you. Um, I wonder if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask Tiffany whilst we're, we're here. Going back to that first fateful walk and then the journey you've been on since, um, what would you say are the main things you've changed in the way you live your own life? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so, over, definitely since so I start, I would say that first walk was around two years ago in terms of how long it takes to write and publish a book. Um, and in that time, just kind of, I don't think it's coincidental that I've kind of been exploring this as well, but I've become really, really interested in seasonal living and just trying to live more in connection with the natural rhythms of the day and the year. Um, so I've definitely, it's very easy for me to say it because I'm freelance, so I, you know, I, I don't, I can do what I want in my daytime and I can, you know, faff about and do whatever, but I am really trying to just kind of, live more in tune with the seasons and the rhythms of the day because we're one of the only species that seems to think it's okay to kind of power through the whole year if it's, as if every month is the same so we we think july is the same working conditions as december when other animals are like hibernating and then we wonder why we get stressed and depressed it's just crazy that we're like well that's obvious you know obviously the modern world is not so accommodating so I, it's not like i can just be like well i'm not going to work for three months um but i am just trying to do little things in my life where i'm just trying to be more observant of what What's going on around me in the landscape just trying to slow down a bit in winter get a bit more energy in the spring um, which I'm it's a journey I'm still on but that definitely sprung from um, being more in tune with the with the circadian rhythm and looking at light and dark because again the night is something we kind of tend to ignore or we're very discouraged from exploring especially as a woman I used to when my mum was um, knew I was writing this I wouldn't tell her I was going on a night walk until after I'd been <laughs> Because she'd be like, no. Um, but yeah, you know, it's very empowering being out at night. Actually, I absolutely love it. I love being out on my own, in, especially in the countryside. I feel very safe and um, just being out in, in the dark and just, just noticing what the night is like and not just thinking of night as a time to just go to sleep until tomorrow. You know, it's, it's a whole hidden world. And I'm just trying to be more observant of the, the whole cycle, really. <laughs>
Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm curious to know how do you collect your ideas when you, uh, like from collecting the ideas to sit down and start uh, actually writing your book and uh, I see that like you of, of course illustrate your own uh, words so um, I'm curious to know like. Like the process. Yeah. Good, uh, good question. Um, what do I do? I, I, I tend to so I do all the research and just write terrible notes, just scroll, scroll, scroll notes, um, either on my computer or on Google Drive, um, which I love. <laughs> um, and I tend to just chuck all the notes. I can't really start writing until I feel like I have all the content there in some form. And then I'll sit down and be like, right, I've actually got to make this readable now. So I'll, I usually, I'm very methodical actually. I, I, I kind of start from the beginning and write till the end. So I, I, I would love to be able to dip into chapters and be like, oh, this needs tweaking. But I, I'm a little bit anal about it and I can't move on <laughs> with something until that bit's done. I, it's so stupid, but I kind of feel like, what if I died halfway through writing? And they thought that this was my best work. <laughs> like, no, it's got to be perfect. So it's ridiculous because it's a really slow process doing that. But then I do know that when I finish the first draft, it's kind of done. Um, um, and yeah, and I always do the illustrations afterwards because I tend to just think, well, I don't know what I'm going to write about yet, so then I can reflect what's on there. But yeah, I'm quite methodical. Uh, I do things step by step. Um, yeah, it, but I feel like that's not always the most efficient way to do it. <laughs> Thank you for this. Um, I have a question that's a little bit different from what you've been talking about in terms of the nighttime and rituals, not the, um, you know, the religious or spiritual or methodical reflective. Um, given the fact that I'm, well, I'm American, <laughs> and I'm fascinated by uh, bonfire night, um, and the idea not just of you know, the fireworks and celebration, but children throwing effigies on a bonfire is, is just, it was a little disconcerting to me at first. It's, it's wonderful tradition, but I'd, I'd wonder if you have any reflections on something like that. That's a great question, actually. I was thinking that. I was walking along one of the bridges and going past the House of Parliament this day, being like, oh, it's the 5th of November, and I'm walking past Parliament. Oh, what a weird coincidence. Um, that is a great question. I am no historian of British culture, but I do think, having looked at the Celtic fire festivals, which are what so many of our traditions are rooted in, the fire was part of every festival as part of the year, and fire is seen as a cleansing power. So um, it's seen as... I remember at Beltane, for example, everyone would put out all their fires in their house and they'd light this Beltane bonfire and then they would relight all their household fires from that one fire. And it was seen as a very energizing, cleansing, powerful thing, fire. So I, I feel like maybe that's kind of where it comes from. Um, obviously, that predates Guy Fawkes, so I don't really know who decided to start burning <laughs> Guy Fawkes dummies. Um, that would be really fascinating. I'm sure someone's written a book on it somewhere. but. Um, it's a really good question for this time of year and things like fireworks and sparklers and all that sort of stuff, it's, there's something that we are very drawn to in the dark when we, when we light up the dark in that way and it's a real, I think it must be a psychological thing. And when I was in Norway, especially in the three months of darkness, everything, it was really beautiful because the way they kind of combated it was everything, there's this really trendy word, hygge, which means like kind of cosy in Norwegian, oh, I think it's, I think it's Norwegian. Sweet, 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 yeah. yeah, some Scandinavian language. Um, and, uh, but it's this lovely concept of, of cosifying everything. And it's all about embracing that darkness. And walking along this high street in, in Tromsø, all, all the lights, all the windows were full of fairy lights and candles and all this sort of thing. And there's definitely something that we're very drawn to, having light in the darkness. And you can think about sitting around a fire in the dark, you know, 3,000 years ago and how powerful that would have been. So, yeah, I feel like there's some connection there, but I am not a historian of, of Guy Fawkes. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned your love of animals. Do you find that animals behave differently in darkness? Yeah, I mean, generally wild animals tend to, they are either kind of out in the day or out at night. Some of them cross over, like foxes, but most things are either kind of in one or the other. And I did find it really fascinating kind of getting to know the animals of the night because I love owls and badgers and things, but I don't really see them much because they just go to sleep like everyone else does. Um, yeah, so I, I definitely do. But actually, the funny thing is, most nocturnal animals, all their kind of busy behavior that we might see them doing, actually tends to happen at dusk and dawn, right in the middle of the night. Actually, not that much is going on because they've kind of done all that bit, and then they're just kind of chilling out, and then they do some more in the morning. Um, but I definitely notice my dogs behave differently in the night. <laughs> they, they just sleep. They, I'm like, I was expecting, I remember I put a little trail camera around my house once to see what they did in the night, and they just slept all night. I was really disappointed. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming in. Um, Tiffany Francis Baker, thank, thank you. Thank you, thanks very much. <laughs>